think that a lot more people listen to podcasts now and 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 I hate to say nobody has time to read books anymore, but it's, you know, the information is so quick out there that, you know, podcasts and books on tape and or audio books and, and just listen to clips, you know. You spend 30 minutes yeah. in the car and you cover down on it. I do. Every morning I either listen to Fox News or I'm listening to MLB Sports or yeah. Yeah. listen to my audio books. So, yeah, it's a great way to. Great way to learn if you are an, if you fall into that uh, learning category of being an audible learner. Yeah. Then it works perfect. So I, I kind of I'm an audible kinesthetic and then also a you know visual learner. So I have to hit all three. So <laughs> reading, listening, and then actually like doing is how I have to learn and Hands get proficient. At it. Yes, sir. Conducting amphibious operations is part of the Marine Corps DNA, and amphibious vehicles have been a critical component to the Marine Corps operations since their introduction during World War II. The names and models have changed, but one thing has remained constant since their development. Before many of them first crossed the surf in the Pacific, they most likely spent some time in the shores of California at a small test facility called the Amphibious Vehicle Test Branch, or AVTB. The mission of AVTB is to plan, execute, analyze, and report developmental and integrated test and evaluation events to characterize the performance of amphibious and ground combat vehicle systems to inform acquisition decisions. In other words, they are put through their paces on and off-road courses, and then they face the surf of the mighty Pacific Ocean before a decision is made to make them part of the fleet. Since its inception in 1940s, AVTB has been at the forefront of amphibious vehicle testing and continues to be DOD's only test center specializing in testing, evaluating, and developing the Marine Corps' present and future amphibious combat platforms. AVTB has been the focal point for all generational upgrades of the amphibious vehicle since the LVT, or the Landing Vehicle Tract, which was critical to the success of the Pacific Island Hopping Campaign of World War II. During the preceding decades, AVTB maintained an integral role in testing many of the variant upgrades of the AAV, the Expeditionary Fighting Vehicle, the Marine Personnel Carrier, the Amphibious Assault Vehicle Survivability Upgrades, and most recently, the Amphibious Combat Vehicle. Today, I have the pleasure of speaking with AVTB Director, Lieutenant Colonel Scott Granero. Did I say that correct? Yes, sir. All right. Scott, before we get started, tell us a little bit about yourself and why you decided to join the Marine Corps. Sure. So again, my name is uh, Scott Granero. I was born in Guam, and then uh, to uh, two Marine parents. My, wow. my both my parents were uh, active duty Marine sergeants. So being born in Guam, I got a lot. Of, I always get always the, get the questions of uh, Are you a U.S. citizen? And I have to go back and say yes, I am a U.S. citizen. Not only because both my parents were Marine stationed in Guam at the time, but also because U.S. because uh, Guam is a U.S. territory. And you'd be surprised at how many people just don't know that. That's true. Um, so it, it, I always found that kind of uh, interesting. Interesting fact, you know, after my parents left Guam in uh, 1984, they moved to uh, Camp Lejeune, North Carolina, where I spent majority of my life, uh, where my dad continued to serve and my mom got out in 1989. So uh, we spent majority of my time at Lejeune and uh, in Jacksonville, North Carolina. Uh, I graduated from uh, White Oak High School there in Jacksonville and then uh, proceeded to go to uh, the University of North Carolina at Pembroke uh, back in 2000 uh, through 2004. Um, so during that time period, uh, you know, a lot of change happened in the United States, uh, especially with uh, the attack of 9-11. And uh, there I was in college on September 11, 2001. I just woke up to get ready to go to class, and I remember turning the TV on and seeing all the stuff that was going on. And uh, at the time, my dad was still active duty, and I knew that uh, my dad was supposed to be up in the, the Pentagon during that time period. So my first you know, instinct was, oh, my God, what is going on? Right, and right. Uh, you know, from that point on, um, I knew right off the, I knew immediately after that moment had uh, happened that uh, I needed to join the Marine Corps or join the service to uh, go serve my country because I knew there was something on the horizon um, based on those events. And um, I actually uh, went to go uh, talk to a Marine recruiter uh, not too long after the, that happened. And I remember uh, going in there and talking to the, the recruiter and telling him I was in college and and then, uh, in the you know the words of you know wisdom from him was, hey, we don't know what's going on. Uh, go back to school and you know think about it. And if you want to come back and talk to me later on, uh, the door is always open. 
So I talked to my dad. I talked to a really good friend of mine who was a, at the time a sergeant in the Marine Corps, and uh, got a lot of good uh, got a lot of good information and a lot of wisdom from them. Fast forward a few years later to 2003, as we were preparing for the invasion into uh, in Iraq, uh, I again uh, was animated about joining the military because I did not want to be uh, kind of left out. I, I wanted to have a part, and I wanted to say, you know, 30, 40 years later, you know, that I had a part in. Uh, you know, now what we call Operation Iraqi Freedom and Operation uh, Enduring Freedom. Right. Um, and so with that, uh, I went back to a Marine recruiter. And uh, this time, Marine recruiter said, hey, you got way too many years of college. You need to go up to uh, Raleigh, North Carolina and go talk to the officer selection officer. So I was like, okay, I'll do what you tell me. So I ended up going up to uh, Raleigh, North Carolina, uh, sat down with the, uh, the OSO. Uh, Captain Walker was his name, and I'll, I'll always remember that name. And uh, we kind of talked about the Marine Corps and being an officer and what the difference was between an officer and enlisted. And he talked about leadership. And uh, from that point on, I, you know, I knew that I could handle uh, being a Marine, the physical aspect of it. But being a leader was something that I always liked doing. And, uh, and talking to him about being a leader of Marines was something that I felt uh, that I, was right for me. So from that moment on, I took my uh, initial PFT uh, signed the paperwork, and then waited to hear back about being a Marine officer. And then fortunately that summer, um, right before I graduated uh, college in 2004, I got the word that I was accepted to Officer Cannon School and uh, and uh, never looked back. And so here I am uh, almost 18 years later, uh, still serving. Never thought I would be you know, serving this long, but uh, I'm happy I have because, uh, again, being a Marine officer and being a Marine in general has just it's been something I've always wanted deep down inside. And uh, it was really good to be able to finally uh, make that come to fruition. Well, that's outstanding. I, you know, I think most of us join and, uh, you know, we look forward to doing some things for uh, a few years of our life. And then uh, next thing you know, time flies when you're having fun. But uh, congratulations. Let's switch over to AVTB now. You've been here almost a year. That's right. Okay. Just, just under a year. Now, you've got a, a, a large gathering here, both Marines and civilians. Can you tell us a little bit about the, the setup and structure here? Sure. Uh, and that is one of the core assets of this, uh, this branch is really our, our people and how we're kind of structured. When you look across ABTB, uh, what makes this branch very unique is that we, are, uh, we have a wide range of uh, people that work here at the branch to include Marines, uh, government civilians, and even contractors. And uh, what's really unique and really awesome about uh, this team here at AVTB is that uh, everybody's always all working together towards a common goal, which is uh, you know testing of uh, the Marine Corps' next generation amphibious capability and whatever else we're testing. So you know on the Marine side, we have some of the best in the uh, the assault amphibian community that come here to serve. A lot of senior NCOs come here to be uh, vehicle operators for our testing. Our test directors are some of the best staff NCOs the Assault Amphibious uh, community has to offer uh, who come here and run these uh, test events for us as the directors. And then we also have uh, some of their, Major Halley, who's my deputy, is you know one of the uh, best in his business when it comes to the Assault Amphibian community. And uh, you know again, he helps me ensure that you know a guy who's a non-Amtracker by trade uh, and as an acquisition professional, make sure that the decisions that are made here are done Correctly in line with SOPs from the uh, you know from the Fleet Marine Force in regards to uh, a- ACV operation or, or right. just anything in dealing with the uh, the amphibious environment. So and then from our civilian side, one of the things that is really and just blows my mind every time I think about it is is just how much resonant knowledge and expertise there is here within the branch within our government civilians. When I look down at my uh, my engineering section, I've got about six or seven personnel that have been here. Uh, for well over almost a decade or so. So when you add up all the number of years that uh, of experience that the, my uh, general, uh, my general engineers, uh, my my test engineers down at the engineering section, it's well over a century worth of experience. And that is something that you can't replace. You can't uh, you can't make up for, you know that uh, that experience. So you know that that's a great aspect of uh, the branch. You know they were here from some of them have been here since the. Uh, Expeditionary fighting vehicle days back in the uh, early 2000s uh, through the AAV survivability upgrade right. program and all the way through the uh, amphibious combat vehicle uh, program. So they have a, a great deal of experience and uh, 
provide that on a daily basis for testing. Yeah. I mean, that's, you know, obviously that's expertise you're not going to grow overnight. That's correct. Uh, and that's expertise you're not going to, you know, just find anywhere else. So the, the amount of knowledge that's resident here. So I fascinating. I appreciate you sharing that with us. Now, I know that uh, ACV testing evaluation is taking up a good chunk of your time. How much focus is the branch still uh, doing on ACV? So the uh, ACV will, you know, will be a part of the ACV's life all the way through the end of, end of its life cycle. We still, you know, will have uh, testing requ- ACV testing requirements as the uh, system continues to, new variants continue to be fielded to the, to the FMF. Um, any type of emergent testing requirement that may uh, may pop up, you know, the branch is going to have a part in it. Uh, for example, um, a few months back, uh, there was a safety use message that was uh, that was pushed out, which uh, prevented uh, ACVs from going back into uh, from going into the water. And so, our test branch uh, was instrumental in uh, working with the program office to de- you know determine a uh, tow rope solution, so uh, that way the ACVs could get back into the water. Because the second order effects of that is is when the ACVs don't go in the water, Marines don't train. And when they don't train, you know, that, that's a capability that, uh, that uh, you know, we need to make sure that our Marines have, uh, and because that's the bread and butter of the Marine Corps is our amphibious capability. I'm glad you touched on that because uh, a, a while back we had an episode with uh, Colonel Tim Howe who uh, manages uh, PM AAA. And so he was enlightening us a little bit, you know, A rope is not a rope is not a rope. So uh, the rigor that went into evaluating what was taking place here just with that capability is fascinating. And I think you hit on another key point. I mean, AVTB has been here since the 40s. We fielded AAVs back in the early 70s. You've been part of their life for the last 50 years now, and you continue to do things to test, evaluate, provide safety. What are some of the other things you're still working on uh, some uh, AV stuff here, or your focus mainly ACV. So our our primary focus has really been on the ACV, okay. uh, specifically on their uh, their personnel and command and control variants that uh, is in the process of being fielded to the FMF. So that's been really our focus, specifically with uh, reliability testing, follow on reliability testing. We've done a lot. So when I first got on deck, you know, welcome to AVTB. You know, we're we're going through this. You know long series of uh, reliability, availability, maintainability testing by, by the engineers. And again, it was a great, great way for me to, to learn the uh, ACV because again, my background is engineering. I'm not right. an AM tracker. And uh, you know, it was a great way for me to get a, a good feeling of what the, the vehicle system can do and uh, some of the challenges that it faces. You know, with the ACV, another program that was going on simultaneously was a foreign compa- uh, comparative track testing that we were doing for AAV at the time, oh, yes. which is yeah. where we were looking at a, a more of a rubber tread or track than uh, your, your traditional uh, metal track. Okay. And uh, they were looking at whether, you know, again, we were just doing some analysis on how it would perform inside a water mobility environment. Okay. So that, that was some of the things we did for them. But other than that, uh, as we all know, the, you know, the AAV program is, uh, is slowly but surely uh, uh, divesting and, and sunsetting itself as right, we transition right. more into the uh, ACV family of vehicles. So I know you do have uh, you have some land capability here as well. Obviously, we talk about the water, but you do have some land capability here as well. Can you touch on that a little bit? We do, and uh, so one of the things that uh, one of the areas we're very fortunate to have is the uh, the AMPA, which is a amphibious vehicle uh, training area that's right across the way from our branch. And that area is just large enough for us to be able to go out there and do any type of uh, limited slope testing, uh, allows us to drive around and get some additional miles in the vehicle for reliability testing. And then we also have uh, the wide uh, ranges uh, available to us here at Camp Pendleton. Uh, what makes Camp Pendleton very unique is the fact that, you know, in, in the old, uh, when I first moved here to California, they said you can go surfing in the morning <laughs> and then go skiing at night and be surfing right back later on that evening. And the same can be kind of said here in uh, the Camp Pendleton area. You know, from early in the morning, you can be doing a open ocean swim with your vehicles, coming through the surf zone, and then transiting it throughout the littoral, you know, from a mountainous environment into a desert environment. So when you look at everything that AV or that uh, Camp Pendleton has to offer in regards to like uh, a testing environment, we have everything, you know, we have a, a robust uh, 
testing environment for both land and water mobility testing requirements. I think one of the things that's probably important to, to maybe share is that you execute the test plans for the programs. So you have an assortment of capabilities, engineering, test capabilities and things, but the programs themselves bring you their test plans. Is that, is that a fair statement? Or ideally what they want to do to the, to the capability? Yes, and what we do is we'll work with the program offices and we'll develop the detailed test plan. I got you. So we'll, we'll look at their performance uh, specifications and then we'll develop uh, the detailed test plan based on what the program office is looking for us to test. From there, you know, once, uh, once the test plan has been drafted, uh, we'll push it back to the uh, program office for the review, and then eventually we'll sign it. And that will be a document between us and the program office of detailing, you know, what that test plan looks like, what are some of our objectives that we're trying to meet in regards to, you know, testing, uh, testing the system's capabilities. And, and again, that, that way, it, what it is, is a, it's a document that will, that will outline the length of the test, what we're actually testing to, and then some of the uh, almost like, almost a statement of work between us and the program office right. about what we're going to do for them and what we support them in regards to their testing. Because like you mentioned earlier, uh, our job, we don't really sp- speak on behalf of a, of a specific uh, piece of equipment right. Um, right. or capability. What we do is we test those performance specifications to ensure that what the what the prototype or the vendor is providing is is meeting those performance specifications outlined in the detailed test or in the uh, in the capabilities development document that are driving all those performance specifications. So with that, you know, the way we like to think of ourselves is a kind of a supporting role in regards to uh, providing all that test data back to the acquisition decision makers so that way they can take and make the the next decision to advance the the program uh, or whatever they see fit with the information we provide them. But it's it's uh, it's interesting that you say it really is a collaborative effort because in order for a program to understand how much they want to do, you really do a little bit of a presentation on, here's what we can do. How far can I stretch this vehicle? How far can I stretch this this test? So that's your role, your team's role, I should say. Yeah, and, and again, what we the way we look at ourselves is we kind of look at is we're here to provide an environment for you to be able to test those specifications that you want to, to validate that the system can do. And that's the way we look at it. So again, I like to think of us as kind of a that supporting arms capability, that supporting effort to the main effort, which is the program offices. I like to make sure that, you know, and that's why when we look at what we have here in the branch and the capabilities we have, you know, I'm looking to grow those capabilities mm-hmm. because I want to make sure that the information we're providing the program office is the best information possible, you know, and I'll use, for example, like our, our meteorology lab where we have all of our instrumentation, which provides scientific, you know, data collection capabilities, you know, uh, for us to, you know, put that information together and provide, um, you know, that information to the program office. So, you know, one of my main efforts, uh, you know, from when I came in here, priorities is, is to really uh, modernize our testing uh, instrumentation capabilities. So whether it's data loggers, whether it's our surf array system, which helps us determine like wave heights and length um, that help us provide better information to the to the decision makers. So that way, at the end of the day, they know that the information they got has been uh, is not really you're trying to remove out all the errors, um, all the human factors that go into sometimes test collecting. So we're trying to remove that stuff out. So that way they know that the information are given is is solid information. So I think I mean you you hit on a you you hit on a great point because this is uh, I, I find this fascinating, you know for the novice and me I'd say oh okay they take a ACV they splash it in the water they swim it around they bring it back up but it can take you weeks sometimes months just to prepare and do the do the grunt work so to speak to make sure you have stuff that you just talked about the meteorology capability and I'm not a scientist. Nor do I play one. But. No, no, and uh, and neither and neither am I. You know, I'm like I said earlier. What's what's unique about this branch is the uh, is our people. You know, from our from our engineers, civilian engineers, to our civilians that run the you know our meteorology lab, who are you know skilled people when it comes to uh, electrical engineering. They understand some of the systems, this instrumentation. It's amazing when you see a vehicle prior to it actually being tested, like you talked about, like. It is as simple as putting a vehicle in the water and, and swimming it around, but you know to get all the the data 
that you need to inform the acquisition decision makers, we use this instrumentation. And a lot of it requires a couple of days worth of uh, outfitting the vehicle, you know, to get, you know, to either ballast it to uh, gross vehicle weights or put instrumentation on there that will help archive it, via, whether it's video or, or any other type of, you know, information we need to pull from the system. It takes a couple of days to do that. So there's a lot of preparatory work that goes into um, outfitting the vehicle prior to going to test. So that way, at the end of the day, the information we do pull is, you know, you know that it's a solid product that we're providing. And it's not somebody how, you know, Marines like to call it stubby pencil method. Yep. You know, yep. we are actually well u- on that. <laughs> using we're using sophisticated uh, programs called it MetLab or MATLAB and uh, a few other programs and, and other computer generated processes that help us gather this information. Because uh, if not, then you have some Marine on the beach trying to determine wave heights and and not saying that that's always you know it's it's pretty accurate but at the same time it doesn't always give you the all the information that you you quite need to have to understand what's going on while the vehicle's under test so i've been out on some of those waves they weren't quite three feet like they said i think they might have been a little bigger than three feet so i got to tell you a little secret so i've been coming here well, I haven't been here in a few years, but I, I started coming here back in 2009. And, and I know you've been here almost a year, and i got to share this with you. This place has grown, not necessarily in space-wise, but the capabilities you have here. It, it, it seems that there's a lot more capability out in your ramps and in your bays and whatnot. So it, it's, it really has, uh, has taken off. I know in the past you've had, uh, and, and again, uh, before your time, but... There were times here where you hosted four vendors at once doing evaluations on their vehicles. And it's hard for people to imagine putting four different companies in the, you know, in the water all at once. And your team was still able to preserve the integrity of each of those companies to be able to do their own thing. Have you had any experience as of late with uh, doing some stuff with industry out here? Or is this something that, you know, perhaps you see in the future again? Kind of two, two points uh, to that. So we have having multiple vendors here on, on the, in the ramp uh, simultaneously. And, you know, I'm, like I said, I'm very fortunate to have some very professional individuals that uh, are able to work through many different types of problem sets. And, uh, you know, again, what, you know, when you look around across the ramp and, you know, just the facilities we have, there's a lot of space that we're able to you know, use to position you know, different vendors in different locations, you know, put up some screening so that way there's no uh, chance of, you know, intellectual property being, right. you know, leaked out. So again, you know, we afford them that. And then again, when we're out here, I have enough safety capabilities. Like uh, one of the things, um, you know, that I find very unique about this branch is the amount of uh, safety that we have associated with it. We have multiple uh, ribs, the rubber hold inflatable um, boats, that we utilize for safety boats uh, and for recovery purposes that I'm able to do multiple tests uh, simultaneously with the, with those capabilities. And, uh, and also with, with our vehicle sets we have, we do have, you know, uh, old, older AAVs that we use for recovery for, right. uh, for land recovery and uh, other, other means. And again, that allows us to be able to do multiple simultaneous tests and at the same time do it in separate locations so that way we're not, you know, not letting intellectual property out uh, and kind of giving them their space to be able to operate and do their testing. As an engineer, you rode in in some AAVs way back in the day. Uh, I was saying I found it uh, very funny when I got here. One of the first things I mentioned about my first Amtrak ride in uh, 29 Palms, I was a young lieutenant with uh, 1st Battalion 6 Marines. I was the engineer platoon commander. And we were doing uh, mine clearance uh, line charges uh, oh, shoots okay. with uh, yep. from off the back of the uh, yep. the Amtraks, and so I get to go. You know, here I am, brand new lieutenant out there in the the God's country, Twenty Nine Palms, and uh, shooting Micklicks with uh, the Amtrakers. You know, it was our final Micklick. I think we, at the time we were ten for ten, so we had ten uh, ten fires, ten uh, detonations, which is uh, pretty good when you're you know one hundred percent. And on the way back, I uh, just remember sitting there bouncing around the back of the Amtrak thinking, uh, you know, how miserable of a ride it was because it was so bumpy. But ultimately, in the, the day, it was a good, uh, good relationship. It was awesome, you know, getting that first experience as a young lieutenant. So, And the reason I bring that up is because when I got here, I made that comment to somebody. And I said there was one particular staff sergeant that I remember. His name was uh, Staff Sergeant Pyluk, and I would start talking about it. And next thing you know, somebody's like, hey, I know Pyluk. He works over in the net trailers. <laughs> so, you know, I had to go over and reintroduce myself and, and uh, 
say hello. So, you know, again, it's, it's, it's funny how it comes full circle, you know, you know, here I am a Lieutenant, never think twice about ever running into uh, an Amtracker ever again. And here I am, um, you know, taking over as the director for the test branch and uh, now retired Mr. Pyluk is down there and, uh, you know, I got a chance to go meet him and tell him how awesome of an experience it was for, for me to, uh, you know, experience that Amtrak ride for the first time through the Desert of 29 Palms. So, so this is a, an awesome location here. I mean, you have the schoolhouse across the boat basin. You have third tracks here. Do you have a, an opportunity to interact with them on a semi to pretty regular basis? Or what's that relationship like? I, I do. And uh, we always like to refer to the, the 21 area as a very unique ecosystem. Mm-hmm. And the reason is, is because when you look at the boat base in here, you know, you have ABTB, you have the Assault Amphibian Schoolhouse, and then you have 3rd uh, Assault Amphibian Battalion all working together here in the 21 area, whether it's trained Marines on how to operate the uh, amphibious combat vehicle or the AAVs, Marines who are actually going out there in employment and operational environment, and then you have us testing them. So when you really look at it, it's it's a very unique ecosystem because we all rely on each other for, for multiple things. Uh, the schoolhouse relies on us to kind of help with the with the new equipment training. Like we provide safety boats for their new equipment training that has worked through the program office. Third tracks and us, and anytime we have a test that comes down from PMAAA, until I receive my uh, ACVs uh, as part of the fielding plan here in the near future, I have to rely on either the schoolhouse or the third tracks to provide you know that, that uh, ACV, oh, the resources to, the do, resources that. to do that gotcha. testing. So again, it, it helps to you know, have that working relationship with both those organizations because not only, you know, do I assist them and, you know, if there's a a challenge like the tow rope solution with me testing as quickly as possible so we can get that solution, you know, work that, get that information to the program office so they can work that, uh, that solution because the second order effects on that is the, uh, is the fleet marine force. You know, once we were able to get that and the safety release message was, uh, you know, was lifted, then they can get back out there and start training. And which is a good thing because we need that, uh, you need that training. Those Marines need to get out there and, and, and learn their skill and learn their trade, especially with the new program that, you know, that we see today. So There's nothing like hands-on, the ability to actually put your hands on a piece of gear and, and have it do what it's designed to do. That's correct. I know you've touched on this a little bit, but, and, and as it relates to uh, ACV and different variants, but what's next for AVTB? So I'm, I'm glad you brought that question up. Uh, it's on because the horizon. So I will tell you that since the day I got here, that has been on my mind. I spent the past four years in uh, Okinawa and uh, living force design and kind of seeing some mm-hmm. of the things that were coming back from uh, from here. And when I got to uh, ABTB this past summer, and I looked at everything we did here. I was like, this is exactly, you know, the the best organization in the Marine Corps to advance littoral kind of look relook at the focus of the littorals like with the force design 2030 right. and say yep this is the best organization to do testing for anything that's material solutions that's going to be utilized in a littoral environment so i've been you know spending the past like nine months talking to staff observing and, and trying to see how can we be a better service to the marine corps at large and the dod by providing uh testing capabilities you know when you really look at you know force design 2030 in the Commandant's vision and just what we're doing with expeditionary advanced-based operations and, and littoral operations in the contested environment, you know, this is a perfect organization to, to test anything that's going to be utilized in those environments. Um, not only do we have, you know, Marines and civilians that have been working amphibious vehicle programs since, you know, for many, many years, but, you know, you have the littorals of, you know, Camp Pendleton, you know, 20 plus miles of coastline that in all the training ranges out there that can support, you know, both the water mobility and land mobility testing requirements. So why not ABTB? So what we're looking in the future, you know, what's on the horizon is how do we maintain our, you know, primary responsibilities, which is supporting, you know, the Marine Corps amphibious capabilities, but also opening the aperture, really kind of informing the rest of the Marine Corps about what we can do here at the branch. And then, reaching out to them and bringing some of their um, water mobility requirements that they may have in their program, specifically ones that support, you know, Force Design 2030. And as I look to the future, some of my guidance to uh, my staff is really, how do we posture ourselves? How do we restructure? How do we modernize our instrumentation and our testing capabilities 
to be postured, ready to receive or test equipment that's going to be, you know, look to be tested here in the near future as we start to develop more requirements, more material solutions uh, that are going to be utilized in a, you know, expeditionary advance based type operations uh, here in the near future. So that's what we're trying to do with this branch. I think in some ways, I mean, you, you've, you've touched on a lot of things, but I, I think in some ways you and your team have already validated a portion of the Commandant's planning guidance. I think this has been a place where you've taken some of these capabilities and you've said, hey, it can do X, Y, and Z and be able to support the future mission in, in, in this respective area. The Commander General Pasajan likes to say these are exciting times, but they really are exciting times. This is, uh, you know, this is an evolutionary change for the Marine Corps. And congratulations to you and the team because you're, you're part of that, that change process that's taking place. Now, I got to ask you, you're an engineer. You're not a novice to AAVs, and I'm sure you've spent a little time in one or two or a few before coming here. So you had some background in it. I, I did. And uh, the great thing about engineers... Um, my, you guys my, blow up stuff all the time, right? We do, uh, and uh, I, I just want to make sure I, I, I get that straight. Yeah, and you know, and, and now I'm, I'm an acquisition professional. Uh, okay. Now I'm an eighty sixty one, but you know, and I can, I'll share that later on about uh, you know why I made the decision to go acquisitions and not stay engineering. But one of the things that I, I tell all my uh, my Amtrak uh, you know brothers and sisters here within the branch is that yeah, I may not be an Amtracker, but we share a lot of commonality. In the sense where you know we grew up, at, we, you know, as I grew up in the combat engineer world uh, or with the uh, combat engineer battalions uh, as a young lieutenant, where you are directly supporting the infantry battalions, mm-hmm. and just like the AM trackers who directly support the infantry battalions and provide them the, that mobility capability, you know, we have to we understand what it means to be a supporting effort uh, for you know for the infantry. You know, we share a lot of commonality with that, and at the same time, we rely on each other. Because when you go into a breaching operation, you know, which, you know, used to be something that, you know, we used to always uh, pride ourselves on is mobility, mobility and breaching uh, capabilities is whenever you did like any type of breaching scenario with a sand table or you actually were out 20 palms going through a a live breaching, um, breaching scenario, you know, you're working alongside the AM trackers, whether you're shooting a a, a Mark 154 at the back of a triple shot, you know, AAV, or you're shooting off the back of a trailer or riding in the back and, and creating your entrance and exit funnels and your uh, and your rails for your uh, your your assault force to go through once right. you make the breach. We had a lot of good relationships and a lot of working together to, uh, you know, and again, that's why I think I'm a great fit for this organization is because I'm complimentary to what they do here. You know, I bring my experience as an engineer and as an acquisition professional, take what they provide as Amtrackers and, you know, and, and kind of work to, to come up with some great solutions. So I got to ask you a couple more questions. When did you make the transition acquisition? So I made the transition acquisitions in uh, November of 2020. Okay. So I was uh, it was currently in the G3, third uh, MLG in over in Okinawa, and I was uh, I was contemplating on whether or not I wanted to, you know, what I wanted to do next in my my career as a, as a Marine officer. And, uh, you know, one of the things that uh, really, uh, I was very fortunate, I spent um, three years at the program office working for uh, Mr. Uh, Mr. Joe Klosak and uh, Mr. Jack Cave, oh, okay. who was uh, P, uh, and Jack was at the time the PM uh, Engineer Systems, and, um, oh, excuse me, uh, PM of Combat Support Systems, yeah. and Mr. Joe Klosak was the product manager for uh, Engineer Systems. Uh, you know, you couldn't have asked for two better uh, former Marines to... Uh, to kind of mentor and kind of give me this understanding of what acquisitions is and the impact that you can have at the enterprise level. And like I said, when I was sitting there, you know, kind of looking at uh, force design and, and I wanted to have a part of, you know, a larger part in the transition of the Marine Corps into the Commandant's vision for for, uh, force design, I started saying, what could I do more? um, What could I help out more, whether it was in acquisitions or engineering? And, uh, you know, talking to my my family and, uh, you know, looking at what, what was, you know, kind of, you know, for me, what I thought could have more impact on the enterprise at large was going acquisitions. And so at the, at the time, it was just felt, it felt like the right decision for me. And, uh, you know, when I got selected uh, for it, uh, I was extremely happy because I know that me becoming an acquisition officer uh, meant that I was going to have more of an impact at the enterprise level. And maybe not necessarily today, but 
by 2030, you know, when, uh, you know, I looked, you look back, whether I'm still active duty or retired, I can say that my efforts, you know, went to bringing that capability to the Marine Corps and, and preparing us for, you know, our future, you know, future operating environment. What we all look at is, you know, our uh, pacing threat out in the Indo-Pacific and, and just kind of preparing ourselves for that potential uh, adversary. Very similar to what we saw, you know, in the uh, interwar periods between World War One and World War Two. Mm -hmm. You know, I feel like, you know, my, my role as an acquisition guy kind of helps uh, look back. You know, when they look back at this time period, they'll say, hey, a lot of things were done right that helped set us up for the next potential conflict in the near near future. I think that's a great, a great summary. And I, I work with Jack on a regular basis, so I may be a little bit biased, but I'll certainly have to give him credit for a, a good recruiting effort on his part. I got to ask you one more question before we jump into uh, what many consider the uh, favorite part of the show. But before I do that, I must ask you about a tradition that went on here for, uh, for many years. But unfortunately, like so many things, COVID has hampered, uh, I, I believe, for the, the past several years now, the traditional Christmas parade that you all used to do here. I, I know it's before your time, but I understand Santa used to ride an AV during the boat parade and give out toys. Is that something you hope to... Uh, Envision to bring back in the future, in the near future. Yeah, you know, and and, and I don't want to put you on the spot. No, no, or no. You to anything. No, no, no. <laughs> and I'm glad you brought it up because that's one of the things I've been talking to my guys about was you know COVID across the across the board, both in the Marine Corps and and just in civilian life has really kind of impacted how you know a lot of traditions and a lot of ways of how we used to how we interact with our with each other. And one of the things that uh, you know I'm committed to with the branch is. And I told my staff this is that we need to start getting back into, you know, doing some of our traditional things, you know, like the, the ABTB did in the past, like like right. this. You know, that's one of the things I asked my staff to look into is like any opportunities we have to go out and do something uh, within the local military community. You know, that's something I really want to do, uh, whether it's, you know, you know, once we are fielded our ACVs and I was just going to yeah, say, I don't yeah. want to get ahead of yourself, yeah. but Santa may want an upgraded vehicle. Yeah. You know, so you may have to wait a year or two until you get something. Here. Yeah. And you know, and, and I'm all for it. Like I said, I think that, uh, the best thing for our branch to do is get back to some of our traditional things, because again, what makes the branch so unique is our people. And, you know, when you take away the abilities to kind of like come together as an organization, you lose, or you potentially lose some of that, uh, that team, team effort, that mm -hmm. that team unity, and uh, you know, again, things like the Christmas Christmas parties, Christmas parades. Uh, ABTB is known for their annual boat races that they do Spotty, out here in the right. boat basin. You know, when you when you take those away, you know, you lose a little bit. The morale kind of goes down, and and it's good to see things coming back online because it increases your morale. And again, this organization, what makes it so special is its people. And if you don't have happy people, then you're, you know, it's going to be very hard to keep those good people around here, this branch to keep them working. Well, I got to tell you, I mean, this has been a great conversation for me because I have a, personally, I have a soft spot for AVTB. I mean, I deployed out of here. We were in a different spot on the base before the MEF transition down here, but it's so great to come out here. Every opportunity I get to do something. I think you've got an incredible team here, uh, an incredible capability I don't think you've even gotten anywhere close to where your potential is. You got a lot of activities going on, so I'm going to let you get back to work. Uh, I want to thank you for making the time to join us today. But before I let you go, I got one more thing we usually do around here at the show. So are you ready for the lightning round? Sure. Fire away. I'll bring it on. So what's your favorite duty station? My favorite duty station so far has been Okinawa. Okay. I thought you might say Guam, but you have a different well, I time. was I was born in Guam. <laughs> And because of COVID, I unfortunately was never able in the four years I was there really? to go vi back and visit. Wow. So I, I promised my mom that uh, sometime here in the future, I will make my way, whether it's Space A or I'll buy a plane ticket and fly out there. But I got to make my way back to my, my birthplace. So, Well, I, I commend you for that. That's uh, great on your part. What's a TV show, a book, a movie, or a podcast you'd recommend? Honestly, uh, I haven't had much time to watch uh, TV or even even read books because of um, you know finishing up a master's degree through Naval Post Graduate oh, School. Great. But I will tell you that uh, one of the things that uh, I think that uh, two things have been very beneficial for my time at Naval Post Graduate School doing their distance education program is one is the uh, the acquisition research 
articles they push out, mm-hmm. and also uh, the the Naval Institute was a good one. You know, one of the things I, I highly recommend is that you know get your hands on those Marine Corps Gazette, read those you know real quick articles because it helps keep you informed of what's going on throughout you know the fleet, whether you know Navy or Marine Corps. And even expand it out a little bit and, and look at some of the business side of that, you know, you know, outside of the Marine Corps, outside of DOD and see what's going on in, in industry. And then the last part of that one, you know, and it's something that, uh, you know, I've, I've started, you know, me on a professional level. And I highly recommend people is, you know, start reading more about becoming better writers, better how to write not only like information papers, but how to do better research. And the reason I say all this is because there's a lot of there's a lot of smart people in the Marine Corps who have a lot of great ideas. But the number one thing they fail to do is put it on paper and get it published for everybody to hear. And and I will say that I've listened to many people that have some great ideas about force design and how to, you know, better prepare the Marine Corps for, you know, the future. But what they fail to do is get it on paper. Again, I'm a little biased here because, uh, you know, you, if, if, if they would do that, it'd probably make my job a little easier. I do dabble on reviewing a few point papers from time to time. So, But I got to throw in a plug here. You mentioned the Gazette, and I think that's spot on. So I got to tell everybody out there, if you get a chance, get your hands on the May edition of the Gazette. It's a great acquisition edition, a lot of great articles in there. So thanks for bringing that up. So if you weren't doing this, if Lieutenant Colonel Scott Ranieri wasn't wearing that Marine Corps outfit, what would he be doing? If I could do whatever I wanted right now, and again, had the the talent to do it, I'd be playing professional baseball, just like every American boy out there, you know, or, or girl that would want to play professional sports, you know, again, the opportunity to play baseball uh, professionally in front of thousands of people would be in, would be something awesome. However, I do live in, uh, I do, I am uh, a realist here and I understand that uh, I wasn't born with those God-given abilities, but if I wasn't a Marine, I'd probably be doing something in line with the uh, service. One of the things that really fascinates me is the forestry. Uh, I would love uh, when I retire from the Marine Corps to potentially maybe get a job, you know, later on uh, doing, you know, working for the national parks as a park ranger or even being a, a firefighter working uh, forest fires out west, uh, you know, and, uh, you know, out in the national parks or anywhere up in the uh, areas that are been impacted by forest fires. Because I just find it very fascinating. I'm all about service, hence the reason why the Marine Corps is a very uh, good organization for me. I think I'm going to have you talk to my oldest son because, you know, I went through six years of school, graduated from Virginia Tech, and he works for the uh, state parks of Virginia. So, and he loves being outdoors each and every day. Just looking at the weather here in your, your, your office, I, it, it's a great place to be. If you had any superpower, what would it be? So if I could have any superpower, it would be to stop time. And, uh, you know, and again, I forgot to mention this when you, when, oh, you when we talked about our introductions. Like, I forgot to mention, like, my wife and my, my two sons. But uh, We were know, saving the best for last. Yeah, you got to be able to segue right into that. My wife and I have been together for almost 20 years now. We met in oh, Wilmington, North Carolina. Prior to me coming into the Marine Corps, uh, she didn't really, she had grown up in a small farming community called Williamson, North Carolina, which okay. is not too far outside of Greenville. Uh, yeah. Had no no military experience and had no idea what the Marine Corps was all about. However, she uh, she stuck with me through the past, you know, uh, 18 years of service and, uh, you know, has been there while I've been deployed for, you know, to Iraq and to Afghanistan and raised my two boys, uh, Colin and Luke, uh, who are now 13 and 10. Uh, and done a phenomenal job of uh, ensuring that whenever I'm not there, that they're uh, they're taken care of. And um, you know, so I got to ask you, either one of them baseball? They are. They're both. Right. Uh, yeah, they're both. Uh, Stick to it, because I, I 20 years under my belt of uh, going to all them games, and I got two boys that went through high school, played there. You know, so. Oh yeah. I see that in your genes. Well, you know, <laughs> I, that will tell you this: they're uh, they're both they both have a love for baseball. That's awesome. Um, I hope that uh, they also do Boy Scouts. I hope they uh, they follow my path and uh, earn their Eagle Scout rank, which I hold near and dear to my heart. The reason I say stop time is is a couple of reasons. One is I've always I've taken taken for granted uh, how good my wife is taking care of our family, and uh, you know you come home and you're really tired, and you know. And sometimes, like, the kids will ask, hey, Dad, can we go outside and play catch? You know, can we go do something? And, you know, you, you kind of blow it off because you're like, hey, I got, you know, we'll do it tomorrow. But, uh, you know, sometimes you always 
think to yourself like, man, you, you can't do that. You know, if I could stop time, because I look back and I miss the days when my kids were, you know, want to come sit on the couch and cuddle with you. Now they're, you know, don't want to have anything to do with you sometimes. So, you know, again, when I talk about stopping time, it's really to stop time, to spend more time and really appreciate all the things you have, you know, you know, and that's the reason why I'd want to stop time, you know, and have that superpower. No, I can't tell you how, uh, how meaningful that is as somebody whose youngest is 20 now. It's it certainly uh, the years go by and they go by rather quickly. But listen, you, you sound like you got a, a fantastic family. And that's that's half the battle right there. Having somebody in the home front taking care of things for you. I want to say thank you for your time again. I want to wish you all the best of luck with everything that you do here. Uh, and keep doing what you're doing. Lieutenant Colonel Scott Guarneri. Sorry. Granero. Granero. Sorry. It's we'll, all right. We'll do that one again. <laughs> Thanks for your time. Hey, no all problem. Right. Hey, thank you for coming down. I, I Again, I greatly appreciate uh, the opportunity to talk about AVTB and uh, our, our people and, and what makes us so unique and uh, you know, kind of our vision for the future and what I want to do for, uh, you know, for the Marine Corps at large and, and provide this, uh, this capability to them. Thank you. Well, this concludes another episode of Equipping the Corps. I hope you've enjoyed our conversation today. If so, please take a couple minutes, leave us a review, subscribe, tell your friends about us. Till next time, Manny Pacheco signing off.